living Australian writers are read as often or have their words valued as much as Professor Walter Murdoch, the 87-year-old former Chancellor of the University of Western Australia. Professor Murdoch is not a writer of Australian ballads, as were Patterson, Lawson or Dennis, but his works are memorable as classics in Australian literature. Professor Murdoch has written an almost countless number of essays. He's been an editor and he's produced manuals and primers of English literature. Professor Murdoch's famous answers to questions are read in many states. He is a man of wisdom and philosophy, and although he is not a poet, Professor Murdoch can blend words into sentences to sound like wonderful music. This is Walter Murdoch. Born in Scotland in Aberdeenshire in 1874, he was destined to become a scholar of rare ability. His early successes were culminated when he became a lecturer in English at the University of Melbourne, and he soon made his mark as a writer and a thinker. He wrote his struggle for freedom and acquired his Master of Arts degree. Apart from his skill as a writer of essays and biographies, Professor Murdoch's wisdom soon marked him as no ordinary backwoods philosopher. His advice and his opinions were sought after. He became noted as one of Perth's hardest thinkers. Yet, paradoxically, Professor Murdoch was equally noted for his whimsical humour, and to this day, this flair remains. Since coming to Perth 50 years ago, Professor Murdoch has produced his best works. His collected essays were published under the title Loose Leaves. He then wrote The Australian Citizen, The Making of Australia, Alfred Deacon, which is recognised as Professor Murdoch's best work. Speaking personally. Saturday mornings. Moreover. Collected essays of 1938-1940, the spur of the moment. Steadfast. And so many others. Professor Murdoch's famous answers are still syndicated to most states. And even now, in his 88th year, he writes one answer every week. Here he sorts through questions with his wife. He married again this year. Once, Professor Murdoch was asked, when does a person get old? He wrote, you are young while you live on love and hope and faith. When you find yourself living on memory, you know that you've grown old. And the answer seems to be Professor Murdoch's own philosophy. Whatever the key to mental vitality may be, the professor seems to hold it. No one can deny that he is still a dynamic thinker. In conversation, Professor Murdoch's mastery of the language, his deep wisdom and magnetic personality make him an almost awesome speaker. But if he is intense, he can quickly relieve the pattern of conversation with his sparkling humour. Darcy Farrell discovered this in the following interview with Professor Murdoch. Professor, you have seen all of this century and a great deal of last century. What strikes you as being the major development of that time? Uh, the splitting of the atom. I think undoubtedly, when we think of all the possibilities that have developed, we didn't know at the time. I don't think anything can compare with that, uh, except perhaps you could put it in a more concrete way, the most, uh, the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima, the atom bomb on Hiroshima was the most startling event of my time, in my life. Was, what, was, mm, what was your reaction when the bomb was dropped? That's, uh, I'm accustomed to difficult questions. But that beats me. Just wonder, astonishment, consternation. I didn't see what it was going to lead to, neither did anyone else. Lord Rutherford, when he split the atom, said that uh, he didn't think this would have any practical consequences at all. I don't know what he would have felt like if he'd known what they were going to be. Hmm. No, that's all that I can answer that to that question. I think that was undoubtedly the greatest event of my time. Now, you've also seen 50 years in the development of the city of Perth. 
You've seen it grow to become a splendid and modern city. Has it always been like this? Could you tell us something about those early days? Well, uh, <clears throat> you mustn't speak as if I were one of the pioneers and as if I'd just been naked blackfellows around when I came here. But uh, if you look out of the window there, you'll see that I've got had the ideal spot. I've been in this house for 40 years. The ideal spot for watching the most phenomenal growth in the city. Those ugly buildings there have mostly come since I built this house. But uh, I don't know that I've anything to say about it. It's grown in various ways. It's grown in spirit and uh, as well as commercially and so on. They weren't pioneers when I came here exactly, but uh, it was more or less a barbaric place when I came. You see, it took a week in the boat. There was no transcontinental railway in those days. And we were most isolated here in Perth. And in many ways, we were very provincial. But, uh, well, we realized that we, were, we might as well be on an island as far as Melbourne and Sydney we, were, we are nearer Surabaya than we are to Sydney now. We might have been away in the middle of the ocean. And there was a certain insularity, very noticeable. Now we're becoming more uh, cosmopolitan. That's all I can think of, the difference. No normal development of a, will be a great city someday. You did mention that those ugly buildings, which I assume you're referring to the modern trend, uh, weren't there in your days. Uh, do you dislike them, do you? I, I'm sorry that the old town hall is blotted out there. I can't see the town hall now from there. That used to be a landmark there. But, oh, that's nothing, no. No, these... Uh, dwarf skyscrapers that we have there are not. You can't break out. They're beautiful. I hope you won't try to convince me they're beautiful buildings. But it may be a beautiful... It's naturally, it's the most beautiful city in Australia, I think, except perhaps Hobart. I've been in all the capitals except Canberra. I believe that's rather easy to look at. But uh, I think Perth is the most beautiful of the capitals. And uh, I noticed about it from the very beginning a certain friendliness in the people here that make me hope, oh, I shouldn't say this, make me almost wish that the city wouldn't grow any bigger than it is. Melbourne and Sydney are, are too big. They're not fit to live in. This is just about the right size. Professor, could you tell us about your appointment to Perth in those first days at the university? Well, I was in Melbourne at the time that I was appointed. I hope you don't want me to tell you what my reaction to that appointment was. There was some surprise, but not quite so much as when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. <laughs> there were three men here, very prominent. Sir Winthrop Hackett, and Archbishop Riley, Bishop Riley, as he was then, they were the men who put their backs into uh, founding a university here. here. Uh, Sir John Forrest, Lord Forrest, as he afterwards became, was of the opinion that we started, that we were starting 20 years too early. He was very reluctant to have a university here. And uh, he didn't hesitate to tell us so on all possible occasions. But uh, on the whole, the attitude of people was tolerant. They thought it was all right having a university. Uh, I don't know that I can tell you anything about the first days of the university. We started with 183 students. So Winthrop Hackett was very gratified that there were any students at all. As he thought, very likely, nobody would turn up. 
and he told us that if we had no students, all we, what we had to do was to get into contact with the public. We got very tired of that, <laughs> get into contact with the public. And uh, we did try that, try to get into contact with the public. Some of us rather too much, I dare say. But, uh, oh, it, it very quickly began to grow and uh, people were reconciled to the idea of having a university here. Generally, were people familiar with the aims of the university? No, they had no idea what a university was or what it was for. It was going to be some sort of glorified school, but, uh, well, I'll give you an instance. Uh, I was coming up from Cottesloe one day and I was rather late for my lecture at the university and I got into a hansom cab at the station. I don't suppose you've ever been in a hansom cab, have you? Not here. You took through the route to the man who was driving it, and I told him to drive me to the university, and please to hurry up. And he said, the university, what's that? It's a picture theatre, isn't it? Perhaps it was, I don't know, but I, I couldn't explain to him that we weren't making pictures of ourselves. But another example of the unpreparedness of the was the surprise that someone expressed when uh, he or she met me and saw that I was comparatively normal. I was in those days. <laughs> and uh, he or she said that he or she expected us to have butterfly nets and goggles. The un understanding was that a professor was a person in goggles with butterfly net. What the butterfly nets, whether we were all to be entomologists, I don't know, but that was the general impression that they were queer, eccentric people, university professors. Oh, I don't know whether they were disappointed when they found we were just very ordinary. What about your own works? When was your first publication? Uh, in book form, I started by writing school books, very humble. I wrote a little history of England, which has long since been forgotten. I had my accolade when John Curtin, when Prime Minister, told a Perth audience that he'd been brought up on that book the struggle for freedom. I must admit that I was on in the hall w with him on the platform. I forget what we were up to, abolishing poverty, I think, if I remember rightly, some little thing like that. And uh, he paid that tribute to me, which is the nicest I've ever had from anyone. But, uh, oh, I began writing articles for the papers and uh, published them, some of them, in a little volume. I don't know when that was. I can't trust my own memory, unfortunately. You know, the Victorian Historical Society, when it was founded, after it had been going for about a year, the president of it uh, told me that he'd come to the conclusion that old men were awful liars. We don't mean to be liars, but we forget and uh, when you ask me to reminisce on these things uh, don't take them as gospel because i may be wrong about these things not that it matters anyway but uh, i think my first book of essays was called loose leaves and uh, it was a paper covered volume Someone advertised it, some of the publishers advertised it as Loose Lives. And there was a bit of a run on it for a moment. <laughs> but when they found out what it was, of course there was a general disappointment. Uh, that was then, let me see, from, now I'm trying to remember, it's taking me a long time. After I took to writing articles for... Uh, when Hackett asked me to write articles for the West Australian and it occurred to me or occurred to someone that they wouldn't go badly in a volume, some of these, 
That was the beginning of a series of collections of essays that I published, and uh, I think that's all I can remember. Professor, what do you consider was your best work and why? My least bad work, you mean? Yes, well, I don't know. My best work, undoubtedly, was The Life of Alfred Deakin. Why? Well, because I was able to get the facts and because I was enthusiastic about the subject. I was a great admirer of Deakin and uh, he was a very friendly man and I think that probably was why that I was, uh, I was able to put the whole of myself into that book describing another man. A big life of Alfred Deakin will be written, is being written now. This was only a sketch, but that was the book I took most pleasure in having written and uh, that I still can look at without shame. One doesn't like to read one's own essays without shame, you know, like the the pelican who looks at her offspring and wonders how such ugly little creatures had ever come to be born. Well, sometimes you feel like that about your own writings, but uh, not in that case, in that life of Deacon. Professor, who do you think was the greatest Australian of your time? Well, that follows up from your last question, doesn't it? I think Deakin was the most brilliant man I've known, and also, I think on the whole, well, I'm no judge. I was going to say that I thought he was the greatest, most statesmanlike person we've had in Australia. And by the way, I was delighted the other day, a few weeks ago, to get a letter from our present Prime Minister, in which he said that Deakin was uh, he was talking about that book of mine. He said Deakin was incomparably the greatest statesman, uh, the greatest prime minister that Australia had ever had. I was glad that Menzies appreciated Deakin. I don't know whether he knew him personally or not, but uh, he compared him with uh, another prime minister Oh, I better not name the other Prime Minister, but he was the best known of them all, and uh, he said it made him sick when he heard people comparing that man with Mr. Deakin. You see, the side of Deakin that I knew was one that was not known to the public at all. How many Prime Ministers of Australia have written uh, books such as Deakin wrote, he wrote one called, they're not published as books, but they're there, they could be published now, one called The Gospel of Shakespeare, one called The Gospel of Wordsworth, one called Poets and Poetry. He was a great student of English literature, and he was very well up in French literature. And uh, when he came home from a fierce debate in Parliament, he used to sit in his den and read French literary criticism. Well, I mean, I'm only mentioning that just as an example of the many-sidedness of the man. But of course, his first thought always was the future of Australia. And uh, I think that he was really the founder of the Australian Commonwealth in the sense that he gave it its shaping ideas and uh, that we're still in Deakin's Australia. Professor, you're a man of the classics and your writings are considered classical. But what do you think of the Australian ballads and poems written by Patterson and Dennis and Lawson? I was enormously struck by them when they came out. I was a young man when they came out, and, uh, well, I don't know why you should couple Lawson and Patterson, 
Banjo Patterson was a master of the jingle connected with race courses. He did them magnificently. Lawson was a much bigger man, really, much more uh, of a poet. When he was at his best, he could write the most awful stuff when he was less than his best, but at his best, <coughs> he was a more human person than Patterson. But uh, on the whole, that bulletin school, as we saw it, as we came to call it, was uh, really the founding of a new kind of Australian poetry, and we all enjoyed it immensely. Influenced by Kipling, I believe, sort of, uh, well, a tendency towards the jingle. We all got, at any rate, terribly tired of the, uh, the bush uh, race course and horses, horses, horses all the time. And uh, Australian poetry turned in other directions. Dennis was a promising person, very promising. I met him, I knew him. He was a frightfully Australian, aggressively Australian young man and uh, the master of an Australian dialect, such as it was, and a man of more humor than either Patterson or Lawson had. But, uh, well, you've asked me about these past, far past times. That's all I would have to say about Banjo Patterson. I admire him, I can still read him at times, but not, not, I'm not always reading. <laughs> well, have you ever attempted to enter this field yourself or ever wished to? Uh, every, every writer finds sometimes that he must drop into verse because he can't, he wants to express things that are inexpressible in prose. But, uh, well, no, I have had no ambition really as a, I'm not a poet and I, found that out pretty early in life. Professor, could you tell us uh, about some of the famous authors you have met and what their great quality was that was common among them? Well, I think of three men in particular who were unquestionably men of genius. One was George Meredith, one was Bernard Shaw, and uh, one was H.G. Wells. I had more talk with George, uh, with H.G. Wells than with any of them when he was here in Perth. Uh, you, the common quality of them, as far as I could see, was that when you mentioned anything that interested them, they caught fire as if you'd put a spark into their minds. And they were off at a pace that no reporter could possibly have kept up with. Every one of those three men was like that, like Tinder. Uh, and another quality I noticed about them was their extraordinary youthfulness. Meredith was, he's forgotten nowadays largely, but he was, uh, he was the, greatest novelist of the late years of the 19th century. Uh, he was well over 80 when I met him. Gives encouragement to us, not to you, but to me. But uh, he was just as much of a boy as ever. I got him onto, I knew that he'd been greatly interested in Napoleon. I steered the conversation. I was having afternoon tea with him in his house in Surrey, and uh, I skillfully steered the conversation onto Napoleon. And then he was off. Bernard Shaw, I saw about uh, a, ma a little biography I'd written of a labor leader whom he had known in England and whom I knew in Australia. 
and uh, they were both concerned in the great water workers, waterside workers strike in the early 90s. Well, uh, I sent Shaw a copy of this little biography of mine, and he wrote and asked me, he said he had a lot of corrections to make on it. He would have, naturally. He was always correcting people. And uh, would I come and see him, he'd put me right about things. Well, he did. And uh, I remember that he said about Champion, the man I was, I'd written about, that he was a terrible worker. He worked like 40,000 devils. He spoke with a nice, a very amiable brogue, Bernard Shaw. 40,000 devils, and that's how he was working at the moment, just going like an in great dynamo. Wells had something of the same. He made tremendous fun of his fellow passengers on the, on the boat on the way out. He described them to me. I felt as if uh, he were writing a novel while, while he was talking. But they all had that in common. They were extraordinarily youthful. Uh, Wells, of course, his mind collapsed after a time, but uh, only for the last few months of his life. They, all, they were all like that. The extraordinary inflammability of their minds, the illumination like a light being turned on in a city all of a sudden, the city being flooded with light. And they were all like that in, the, in their youthfulness. Uh, I only, those are the three men that I happen to be privileged to meet and talk with. And uh, I think probably that's a common trait in men of what we call genius. I wouldn't like to define genius, but in those men, you felt it. There was something in their mind that was different from ordinary people, and that was it. Professor Murdoch, you've given wonderful answers to thousands of questions, and many of these must have been very difficult ones. You haven't quite put that quite right. I've given answers to thousands of wonderful questions. Yes, I've... Uh, I've kept a record and I've answered, it's going on for 2,000 now, answers, but that's nothing to the number that I haven't answered. So you can't answer, some questions are uh, unanswerable by anyone and some are certainly a great many unanswerable by me. Well, you asked me what was the most difficult question. I got one this morning. As a specimen, it will do. What is oxygen? How would you rather like be asked off suddenly, what is oxygen? And they expect, uh, what is oxygen and where does it come from? Well, last week I had a, a question. I'm not going to answer that about oxygen. I leave that to the people that know about oxygen, naturally. Uh, the other day, I, last week, I got the question, does a dog know that he's a dog. Well, I don't know. I, I, I can't put that question aside as not knowing anything about dogs, because I do had a dog all my life pretty well, but uh, whether a dog knows he's a dog or not, well, you try to tackle that question now. I'm going to answer it, though, but I won't tell you what the answer is, because I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult question indeed, Professor. Uh, Professor, you're also known as a philosopher. I'd like to ask you this question. It is said to be a sign of strength and honesty if one has the courage of his convictions. Do you think that man can always be unbending in his honesty? And can he be a, uh, ambitious and honest at the same time? Well, it's better to give up the ambition sometimes, isn't it, if you can't be quite honest. But what a wonderful thing it would be if perfect honesty were introduced into our politics, for instance. People said just what they thought. Would it quench their ambitions? I don't know. You're asking me a question now. I don't know that. I don't know the answer, but I should imagine it'd be worth trying. <laughs> well, talking of politics, have you ever had any desire to be a politician yourself? And uh, if you have, what ideology would you aim to enhance? 
uh, well, I was a great collector of birds' eggs when I was a boy, and I once climbed up to get a, a magpie's nest. And just when I got them, they magpies build pretty high. And after a long climb, and when I'd got two of the magpie's eggs in my mouth, I was going to descend gradually, a bull ant bit me. <laughs> And the result of that was that I went down very quickly and the, the magpie's egg was, uh, eggs were smashed up in my mouth. I don't know if you've ever eaten a magpie's egg raw, but they're not nice things. Well, that cured me of an ambition to go to the tops of gum trees after magpie's nests. And uh, I have discovering in the same way that one's intellectual and emotional limitations I've never desired to be a poet. I knew it was hopeless. And uh, I've never desired to be a politician. Well, you'd take too long explaining to your friends why you were doing it. You went in for politics, I think. <laughs> Finally, Professor, to what do you attribute your longevity? What has been the greatest moment of your life? And what's been your philosophy in life? Uh, oh, my longevity. Do you think it's very old? Well, I suppose uh, thorough avoidance of fresh air and exercise have helped a lot. My smoking has been very helpful too. Or, uh, a man told me the other day that uh, smoking was a poison and I told him, well, I've lived for 80-something years at the time, and I've been smoking since I was about 17. Say roughly I've been smoking for 70 years. No, let me see, I've got this wrong. I was 80 at the time this question was asked me. Well, I said I couldn't see it had done me any harm. And uh, he said, well, you never know. You might be 90 if you hadn't smoked. <laughs> When I told that as rather a joke to a, a friend of mine, a very sober person, he said, well, there may be something in that. <laughs> All I know is that uh, I've lived quite long enough. And uh, what was the other question you asked? What, what's been the greatest moment of your life? Oh, no, I can't tell you that. The greatest moment, I suppose, was being born. What, a, what about your philosophy in life, Professor? I tried to put my philosophy of life into verse. I told you I'm not a poet, and I'm not, but I did try to put it into ver verse once, which I shall recite to you now, if I can remember it. Amid a world of sceptered sham, be this my humble aim, at least, to seem the sort of beast I am, and not some other sort of beast. I think that's a good philosophy of life. Once when asked what he considered a success in life, Professor Murdoch wrote, success and unsuccess are best ignored. To have watched life with undiminished curiosity, to have faced the end of life with courage unimpaired, to have won prizes without the loss of humility, to have met defeat without loss of hope, to have loved and been loved. To have taken delight in simple things and common people. To have kept alive our faith in our fellows and to have done our best according to the measure of our poor abilities to serve them. To have kept our hearts from cruelty and our minds from cynicism. I don't say that this is to make a success of life, but it is at least not to have failed ignobly.